not all loves are created equal as far as the brain is concerned. Um, studies have uh, looked at activity in the brain when recalling passionate or romantic love versus, say, maternal love, and finds that different centers definitely are more active. In other words, they put people into the functional MRI and they said, think about your partner, or think about your lover, and um, certain areas lit up, or they said, think about your mom, and different areas lit up, which is important because um, different areas are responsible for the release of different neurotransmitters, which then come to affect your future feeling states and future behaviors. So during romantic or passionate love, what happens from a neurotransmitter standpoint, those chemicals that are released uh, when you have that particular experience? Dopamine goes up. Dopamine is essentially the neurotransmitter of reward. So it is a neurotransmitter that's released when you have new or novel experience, but particularly experiences that are reinforcing, like gambling um, or something that is really addictive, in fact, literally addictive, it's the neurotransmitter if you snorted cocaine that is most responsible for, wow, that was great and I totally want to do it again. So that is a neurotransmitter that definitely goes up when you are in the throes of romantic or passionate love. And what does that mean for you? It means that you're going to feel the sense of being addicted to your partner. And in fact, it's also the neurotransmitter that goes up for people who have obsessive compulsive disorder. Does that mean you're going to develop OCD? No, but what it does mean is you're probably going to obsess over your partner. In comes another neurotransmitter that's called serotonin. It is definitely a neurotransmitter um, that is active for obsessive compulsive disorder and it means that you're probably, and for depression. Do you become depressed? No, you really don't, but what you do do is a feature of depression called rumination. So you think about your partner over and over and over again in this really um, obsessive manner. And if your partner is separated from you, you're going to have this longing where you're you know, wanting to be with them, kind of like you'd want to be with a drug if it was taken away from you and you were already addicted to it. There are changes in other neurotransmitters as well. So um, if you're physically with your partner, the neurotransmitter oxytocin, which is kind of known as the cuddle um, transmitter, neurotransmitter, um, and that makes you feel like um, warm and snuggly and intensely bonded to this person. It is particularly uh, released following orgasm. So, you know, if you're having sex with your partner and things go well, you're going to feel very attached to them, exceedingly intimate with them, partially because of that neurotransmitter. Um, there are other neurotransmitters that actually also change vasopressin. Um, which has to do with uh, stress level. And so um, there's this whole uh, panoply or of, of release of neurotransmitters that make you feel you know, very obsessed, very addicted, uh, thinking constantly about them, very um, intimately, cuddly attached, and, uh, and stressed, actually. It is a stressful condition to some degree to be really into your partner. So all of these neurotransmitters can definitely be released in lust, okay? Which I'm gonna say is like the earliest stage, perhaps. Um, and so that's why to some degree, it can be good to give it a little bit of time before you invest too much in this person because you can go right up into sort of a, a wonderful addictive neurotransmitter state and not have this be the greatest partner for you. And before you, as it were, invest your resources, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, emotional resources, financial resources, and genetic resources in terms of, for example, having children. You do want to give that initial blip some time to come down so that you can have some reason over whether this is a good partner choice. In terms of the science to support what is a good partner choice, um, for the long haul, it does seem that having 
very similar values and to some degree having a lot of similarities in general often leads to a longer term ability to maintain the relationship. And why is that? And, and I'm not talking now about sexual compatibility. I'm not talking about that, you know, wonderful, passionate feeling, but I'm, I'm really talking about just maintaining any relationship. It is easier when you have fewer bridges to cross. So over time, as this whole neurotransmitter thing settles out, what's left to be able to maintain your relationship going forward? If you're arguing over everything because basically you fundamentally don't agree on most things, that is a challenge. I'm not saying it's a challenge that can't be managed. And I certainly wouldn't say, for example, that opposites can't attract because they often do. But the question is, what do you do with that down the road? If you're a different religion, if you believe differently in how money should be managed, if you have different goals in terms of family rearing, uh, career aspirations, long-term how you want to live your life, these are bridges that have to be crossed with a lot of communication and a lot of compromise. To some degree, studies support the less compromise you have to make the easier, and you know, that's very, that's not surprising, right? That's, that's easy to understand. So, um, so choosing someone with some similarities will make for less compromise down the road. And then the question becomes, how good are you and your partner individually at communication, at compromise, um, at being able to make choices that really aren't your first choice for the service of some greater good? The thing about all this neurotransmitter release is it's, it's very prevalent during new passionate love, um, but it's difficult to maintain. And that's why you know, we're talking all the time about people like it was great at the beginning and then like, where did the fire go? And that's because the state doesn't tend to remain over time. It may remain for several years actually, but to keep um, the kind of passionate love going that most people do, particularly if they get married, want to for life, you really have to work at stoking some of these neurotransmitters. So for example, I might be telling someone who's come to me and said, uh, you know, we're just not, you know, we love each other, but we don't feel in love anymore. And how do we keep the fires going? I'm going to tell you to do things like new novel activity because that is going to raise dopamine and that is going to help keep that whole system in place for you to some degree. I'm going to tell you to have sex more frequently because, um, and I'm going to tell you how to have better sex so that you can hopefully be having an orgasm with your sex so that you can be releasing some of that oxytocin and keeping that really intimate cuddly bonding feeling together. So looking at these different areas and trying to advise you to do things that raise neurotransmitters in the same way that your brain does automatically when you are first in passionate love.